The NFL is turning 100, and USA Today is counting down the all-time greatest teams, players, and icons of the game. Conversations about the greatest of all time require the greatest who covered it. That is why it's my privilege to introduce Christine Brennan, Jarrett Bell, and Kent Summers. Our first topic, guys, is who is the greatest team of all time? Our list says the 85 Bears. What do you think? I like it. I like it. I think that the Bears uh, qualify in many, many respects. When you look at, of course, the stars on the team, Walter Payton, you had uh, Jim McMahon with his crazy headbands and all the nonsense going on there. You had the coaches. You had Mike That doesn't Ditka. mean it's the greatest team just because you have a headband. No, but it was fun. <laughs> it was fun. And, and, of course, we're in the mid-'80s. And if that's, in fact, the greatest decade, according to all, all these teams we've got here, that's a part of it. But uh, also the coaches, Mike Ditka and then the defensive coordinator, Buddy Ryan, of course, a future head coach in the making. Uh, you had Refrigerator Perry. And I think in many ways, the way this team just stormed through the playoffs, they were unstoppable. Mm, I <laughs> don't know. But I can understand why voters would select the Bears based on one season. And, and Christine, you touched on it when you talked about how dominant they were during the playoffs. That defense, that 46 defense was just amazing. Mike Singletary and Wilbur Marshall. And then on offense, you had Walter Payton. Um, but I had a problem with picking the Bears as the number one team because I, they didn't sustain it. Right. And even though we're talking about one team, one season, you know, one collection, one ball of dominance, there's still something to be said for having a team that is able to sustain it, either as a repeat champion yeah. or as part of a dynasty. And so my number one team was the 89 49ers. And the 89 49ers were the fourth 49ers team in that decade to win the Super Bowl. And I think they would have beaten the Bears. In fact, one of the reasons why it really was just a one-year wonder for Chicago was because of the, 89, the, the 49ers of the 80s. And so that's kind of where um, I fall on it. But I totally respect and understand and enjoy the cultural aspects of the Bears as Do you think that that's NFL what makes franchise. them number one is, the persona. is that persona? Oh, the Super Bowl shuffle. I mean, I'm not mm -hmm. here to cause no trouble. <laughs> you know, Everyone. I'm just here to do the Super Bowl Everyone shuffle. Everyone saw that video or uh, got it or bought it. Or a defensive whatever. tackle carrying the ball. Buddy Ryan and, and head coach Mike get Ditka didn't get along, couldn't stand each other. There was that friction. I mean, it was story after story after story. But I kind of lean towards uh, what Jarrett's saying. I don't know if they're the best team Ever. Why do they only win exactly? One? You know, it, 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 it's hard to pick out a single year. I like I like organizations that can sustain it, that find a uh, working relationship between owner, GM, finding a quarterback, and you know, Joe Gibbs did it with the with the Redskins. You know, Bill Walsh did it with the DeBartolos in in San Francisco. I like that. That whole Chicago thing blew up, and maybe that adds to the intrigue of it. There is only one year to evaluate of that Bears era, if you can use that word. Well, and I think what we're talking about here is a little bit of apples and oranges. I mean, the idea of the dynasty, and again, because the 80s was such a golden era, certainly there's others as well in the NFL, uh, versus just that one single season. It's so hard to figure out. So fans are arguing about it too. That's great because that's the essence of what we're, what we're doing here and talking about it. You mentioned Washington, and I covered that team for the Washington Post, and this is, of course, the, the 80s. And Washington with Joe Gibbs won two Super Bowls in the 80s, one in the 90s. And you look at both of those, I, I think at least a shout out for Washington in the midst of these grand you know, dynasties and grand teams of winning in 82 and again in 87. Both of those happen to be strike years. Mm. So what are we saying there? We're talking about organization. We're talking about keeping the team together. We're talking about getting their act together once they come back from the strike in 87. There were replacement players, three games that actually counted. And who could do that better than Jack Kent Cook, the owner, eccentric, a little strange, got mad at me a lot. But then he hires Joe Gibbs and Bobby Bethard and lets them run that team. And Charlie Casserly was also a part of that. And so you see that uh, organizational skill. What does Gibbs do? He leaves the NFL. He goes to NASCAR and immediately wins there. This guy might have been one of the great organizers in the history of sports. And, the, and Washington had the benefit of that for those two so, Super Bowls. So to you, then, why aren't those Joe Gibbs Redskins teams the greatest of all time? 
Well, because uh, that's a good question. I could I could make that case, um, but I do think that the Bears uh, just had something about that season. Frankly, you could even place it in history, which I think with the NFL we should. It's a part of our culture in a way that it's just not sports. And they beat the uh, the Patriots, Tony Eason's <laughs> Patriots, yeah, right? Of all teams. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in the Super Bowl, and the very next day. Um, that was a big New England thing. The very next day, there was another New England story, and it was going to be the teacher going up in space, and that's the space shuttle exploding. And they are they are connected. You talk to Bostonians, and they will remember that Super Bowl, losing to the Bears, fridge, all that fun and games, and then the next day, the horror of the space shuttle. And and uh, so I, I think the Bears are a fine choice, but I do think Washington, hey, if we're talking about coaches, Joe Gibbs, uh, winning that way with three quarterbacks, not a one of whom will ever be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, let me just piggyback on that because I think that's a real significant point when you talk about Washington winning three Super Bowls, like you said, including 91, and doing it with three quarterbacks. The 49ers had Joe Montana. Now, after Montana's heyday, they had Steve Young. But you talk about building a team around a quarterback and then doing it to win championships three times, and you mentioned the, the two strike years. What happens there, you've got to have a team that has that um, credo kind of established mm. that you're going to operate a certain way in the organization in, in terms of how you scout and what type of people you bring in and, and how you develop the chemistry. All of that was part of Washington's mystique. Now, these other teams had it in their own way, too, the 49ers. Uh, even the Giants and, and Parcells and, and the units they had. But um, that is the thing about Washington that really kind of stands out when I think about those teams of that era. How but would we're you all kind of, excuse, we're all kind of guilty of a, a recency bias, I, I guess if you can sure. say going back to the 70s. I mean, if you go back to pre-Super Bowl era, you know, what about those Cleveland teams that dominated oh, yeah. in the 50s? We haven't even talked about Vince Lombardi's Packers, and especially that 1962 team, the yeah. Tom Landry Cowboys, even the Jimmy Johnson Cowboys teams, mm -hmm. three Super Bowls. I mean, fabulous teams. I, I don't know how you Who's pick yours? one season. Ooh, that's a really good question. I, I I tend to be a little bit fond of the 84 49ers. I mean, they beat that Bears team before the Bears team took over. Um, I kind of like that team. I like, I'm partial to some of the teams from uh, the Steelers of the 70s. I, I grew up with those teams. They, you know, the Mean Joe Greens, the Terry Bradshaws, all, all those guys became icons to my generation. And then you say, which of those Steelers yeah, teams? Right. I mean, then you've got that argument, right? right? Well, 74, 75. Yeah. I, and I do think any conversation, I'm so glad you mentioned it, the, the Steelers, because any conversation about greatest teams ever, if you're not mentioning the Pittsburgh Steelers in there, uh, you're, you're missing the mark. Because the Steelers come along, you've had the Dolphins in the perfect season, another very important thing, Don Shula, one of the great class acts in the history of sports. Uh, and, but, but then the Steelers. And one thing I actually looked up, because I remember their drafts were so great, do you guys know this? There's only one team in history to draft in one season four future Hall of Famers. Mm. One season, 74 draft, Lynn Swan, Jack Lambert, John Stallworth, Mike Webster. That by itself is extraordinary. So you young kids out there, that they, the Steelers sound like, uh, you know, it's like this is us or something, which of course they're, you know, that's a big part of the TV show. Um, consider that. That draft alone, Chuck Knoll and those Steelers, Terry Bradshaw, Franco Harris, Mac at reception, wow, you could put them right up there first as far as I'm concerned. And one thing about the Steelers, let me just add this real quickly. You talk about four Super Bowl championships for the Steelers in the 70s, and the first two were really dominated by the defense, much like the Bears in terms of you know, going entire seasons and barely giving up 100 points like the, the Ravens of the 2000 uh, year. Um, and then those latter two Super Bowl victories in the 70s for the Steelers came on the arm of Terry Bradshaw and the big offense with Stallworth and Swan. So they were able to evolve in some ways, too. But you mentioned Don Shula, and I was on a, a panel with the NFL, a blue ribbon panel that included Shula, and we were talking about all things NFL 100. And when we got to uh, the question of, of the, the teams and whatnot, and, and he was actually recused from the entire part of that conversation, but the one thing he said um, in the course of everything was, if you have any questions, just go on the record. <laughs> what was the record? Yeah. Just ask yourself, what was the record? And of course, with the Dolphins, 
Well, yeah, that's, that's all. the whole thing. Is that it's, why aren't they at the top of this list? Because I'll tell you why. Because seventeen and zero for the Dolphins in nineteen seventy two could have easily been, you know, a, a, a <laughs> ten and seven or or, or eleven and six or whatever. Um, because, because they the had a lot of wasn't yeah they there. had yeah they had a lot of close calls. But it is ironic when when you think about it and how it all has has, has kind of shaken down that the one team that the 85 Bears lost to was the <laughs> were the Miami Dolphins mm -hmm. at Miami yeah. with <laughs> Don Shula on the other sideline and some of his 72 Dolphins on the sidelines cheering during <laughs> Monday night football <laughs> for those Dolphins yeah. who were not yeah. that good. They were a good team, a, a really good team in 85, but not obviously at the class of a championship uh, team like the Bears were, but they beat the Bears. And um, we could have really cemented that if the Bears in, in, in 85 win that game and have that perfect season. And we haven't mentioned the Patriots yet That's either. what I was just about to tell, you sort about of dovetail. Seasons? It's like yeah. perfect season. So say the Patriots would have beaten the Giants in, in that Super Bowl. Are they then the greatest team of all time? And that I, was a fluke play. Like, how can so. you really I mean, knock I them? I mean, in this day and age, to do that, to go, what, 18-0 and 0 through a season, and defend, if they had finished that, if that play had not happened in Glendale, Arizona, um, yeah, I think we'd be sitting here. Maybe there wouldn't be a consensus, but I think that would have been one of the first teams that was brought up, maybe number one. You know, and there's probably a, a lot of younger people watching this and saying, why aren't we talking about the Patriots? Your exact question is a younger person yourself among us here. And I think there is a, a tendency sometimes on these kinds of things to hearken back and to think back. And I don't, there's, again, there's no wrong answer here, right? And my goodness, talking about Otto Graham and those Browns teams. Now, that's a name most people have no clue. As a Northwestern grad, I know all about Otto Graham. <laughs> I had to get that in there. But, but the point is that I think there is some time and a tendency to kind of go in the Wayback Machine if you're doing 100 years and say, well, we c couldn't pick anybody that's like still playing, right? Or we couldn't, yes, we, we of course appreciate Brady and Belichick. Of course we do. I mean, we've, we've all written 10 zillion columns about how great Well, we they appreciate are. them more in 50 years. Probably. Mm -hmm. and, and that and, and isn't that interesting? It's almost kind of how the mind works. And and is that fair or right? I don't know, but I think it's where we are. I mm -hmm. think even if you dislike them, I mean, you have to give them their due. In this day and age of free agency, where yeah. the, and especially the league is designed for parity, and mm -hmm. every game is supposed to be within three to seven points, and usually is, et cetera, for them to do what they've done and to almost have an undefeated season. Incredible. Yeah, and, and and one thing that w was obvious earlier this year when I was at the uh, Patriots mini camp, and I was thinking about kind of you know where they are, and here we are starting it over again. And Belichick loves to say it's a new year. Last year doesn't matter, and the year before. And to a degree, that's true. But when you've got Belichick and Brady coming back, you might have 52 other p new players, and yeah. you've got those people still in the building. Well, it's not exactly starting from scratch, even though. You, you do build it up from year to year. But that is really one of the more amazing things about the Patriots is when you look at their first Super Bowl championship team in 2001 where they upset the greatest show on turf, the Rams. Right. Um, that was a totally different thing. Tom Brady is just the second-year quarterback, so he's so wet behind his ears. And then you go a couple, three years later, and they've got this great defense, and they ride that to Super Bowl championships. Then you go to, you know, the Randy Moss years, and they, you know, lights out. And then lately they've gone to some other uh, measures to, to, to get it done, including the miracle comeback and, and being able just to kind of scratch and claw. And that's why I think Belichick will go down as the most resourceful coach in NFL history. And there are a lot of, I mean, you can talk about Paul Brown and Vince Lombardi, etc. But like you said, Kent, we're talking about the Super Bowl era and all of the things that you kind of have to do to stay uh, on top of your game right now. Belichick does that better than no you, one else. You, and that, it's reflected by them winning Super Bowls with so many different types of teams. You mentioned that, okay, we're not really respecting the Patriots as much as maybe we will in 50 years. Is it unequivocal right now that the Patriots, this dynasty that we are seeing, is the greatest dynasty of all time? Again, I don't know that you can definitely years? say that. Uh, it's, it's significant, for sure. Um, I, I mean, I would put it in the top 
just off the top, top three or four, yeah. and then you can have that same conversation we've just been having. I mean, yeah, you look at those sure. 49ers in the 80s, mm -hmm. you know, would you take Montana at his peak or Brady at his peak? And, so. and I know there's more to just discuss about all these things. There's also no doubt that the Patriots are receiving scrutiny that no other team has ever received in part because they've been around for a long time, in part because of our media today. Mm -hmm. So every little detail, you know, back with Otto Graham and the, and the Browns or Vince Lombardi and Bart Starr and the Packers, they didn't have that kind of scrutiny. There was no social media. There's no Twitter. So part of it, too, is you can probably find more things to not like about teams. Granted, the Patriots have also been out there with some big, big scandals. That's what I was just going to say. Is yeah. there a stain on this, in the, on this dynasty where we can say, well, like, maybe some of these wins aren't exactly sure. fair? There might be some. There might be some St. Louis Rams who might say, <laughs> who might say that. But you know whether there's been proof or not. Yeah, that's. But it kind of adds to the intrigue and the sure. mystique of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It makes it fun. The controversy. You know, there we all like a great story. You know, and and certainly the Patriots have given us plenty, sort of off the field, not not what they've done. Exactly yeah, my on mom. Sundays. My mom always said, when you get caught doing something wrong. That's, you're getting caught for all the things that you did in the past. It's not the first time <laughs> that you've been doing things sure. the wrong way. You may have been accumulating some things uh, in, in the past. So, um, like you were saying, the St. Louis Rams might have some things to say about that because when that Spygate thing happened, we know that that wasn't the first time that they did that, right? Yeah, right. Uh, also, and I do think we should look at, there is that argument we could make, which kind of is flying in the face of some of those things we've been saying, about today is the greatest day in terms of athletic achievement until tomorrow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then after tomorrow would be the next day. Mm -hmm. In terms of training, in terms of nutrition, in terms of health. I mean, look at the way Brady Brady's diet. You're telling me that, you know, that uh, Bart Starr or um, Montana would have been eating, you know, the kind of stuff that Brady, yeah. of course not. So, so in some ways, the argument is moot because this is the best team in terms of just pure athleticism. You could make that argument and in, in any sport. I mean, obviously, you try to push the boundaries. The Olympics, they're breaking yeah. world records. They're better than the other ones. That doesn't mean, though, that you wouldn't say pick Babe Didrikson over Jackie Joyner Kersey. I personally would not. But you know what I'm saying? Because there's other tangibles. And I think that's the essence of this conversation. What's interesting, too, is seeing what those teams from different generations had in common. And often it was ownership and coaches who could coexist mm -hmm. for a long time. You know, it was Robert Kraft and Belichick. You know, it was it was the Cowboys of the Tom mm -hmm. Landry era. It was Vince Lombardi being in charge. It was Chuck Knoll and the Roonies with the Steelers. And you could also see that when that didn't work, when all that fell apart, you could see that in the Bears with the clash with Ditka and Buddy Ryan. You know, I know Buddy Ryan left the next year for the Eagles, but certainly, you know, Jerry uh, Jones and Jimmy Johnson. That's, you know, yeah. That should have continued many years and it just could they those two just couldn't if those exist two together. could have been able to exist together what do you think they could have oh been? i i i think they they could have sustained that for quite some time because i think jimmy johnson was that good at identifying talent and developing talent you know jerry really well if you were to ask him and i'm sure maybe you've had conversations with him in the past about mm -hmm. this you know, what would he say he would have done differently in terms of his relationship with Jimmy, knowing that this thing could have sustained longer. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because he's never really um, taken, you know, a, a lot of uh, blame or, or uh, expressed a lot of guilt for how things turned out because his thing was always that he thought that the organization was bigger than the coach. And, you know, they won a Super Bowl with Barry Switzer after Jimmy Johnson, but it was with the team that, that, that Jimmy built. And the thing that we're talking about is how long could they have really sustained that, you know, top of the mountain excellence. Um, and so I think that's the one thing right now that really gnaws at Jerry from, you know, a, a football standpoint. Obviously, the Cowboys are so successful from a business standpoint and from an image and marketing standpoint. But, um, yeah, I, I think deep down, you know, he knows what he had in Jimmy because you think about what he said when he brought Jimmy in and the reason why he brought Jimmy in and they got rid of Tom Landry was because he knew that Jimmy was his company. I mean, he and Jimmy, that's the weird thing. He and Jimmy Johnson were roommates at the University of Arkansas. So they knew each other and they knew each other from way back. That's wild. And yeah. And so for them to have that rift and in the past couple of years, there's been a couple situations where they've been 
in social circles. Like they had a reunion in Dallas for the Super Bowl teams and that sort of thing. But he still hasn't put Jimmy in the ring of honor. And I think that's a shame, to mm. tell you the truth, um, when you talk about the greatness of that team from that era. And so what he's Jimmy still salty to about it, for oh, sure. Totally. That's what I say. He's not really admitted that, hey, this should have gone a different way. Don't you think he would admit, was. though, that I, I, sh I shouldn't have been out drinking with writers at 2 in the morning and, <laughs> and made that comment that I, there are, what, 500 coaches who could have done what Jimmy Johnson did? Yeah. I bet. Yeah, that, would, I bet he would regret that. Yeah, he probably would. But, <laughs> but then again, you know, Jerry is also the one who, who will tell you, hey, as long as you spell my name right, <laughs> it's yeah. okay. To, you know. So he will, he will be a stand-up guy in most situations when it comes to things that he has said, and he's said so many different controversial things. So that's one of the things that you like about him as a, as a journalist is that, you know, he will put it out there. But when it comes to, yeah, this, this whole thing with Jimmy. He didn't yeah, revere him to, in the moment or didn't feel like, didn't want to put him up on that? Oh, at the time, but I think what, what really happened um, intimately and behind the scenes with them and it, it, well, even in how they projected things, Jerry wanted to, to, you know, to make sure that he got credit for doing some of the things that he thought were important to the team as well. Even though Jimmy was, you know, the nuts and bolts guy, they were trying to work in tandem. But you know, you look at like one of the, you know, the most um, significant moves they made right at the beginning was trading Herschel Walker and getting a bushel mm -hmm. of draft picks, which kind of laid the foundation for, for those championship teams. And, okay, Jimmy worked the trade, but Jerry still had to sign off on it. Jerry still had to give Herschel Walker a million-dollar bonus. So, it, that, and that just kind of gets back to the point of what was expressed here earlier about the chemistry that needs to happen mm -hmm. between ownership, Sure. GM, coaches. So much has to go right more than just the roster. Well, mm -hmm. you, I mean, but somebody has to write the check and someone has to say, this is what we can do and this is what we can't do, this is what we shouldn't do. And you, you kind of have to have, you know, the respect to, to, to be able to do it. And, and I think the egos really, because Jimmy could have done things or said things um, to appease Jerry and vice versa. I mean, really. Well, and again, it all comes down to that organization that we're talking yeah. about. I mean, if you want to look back in history of any sport, obviously we're talking NFL here, you've got to have strong leadership and you've got to have a leader who at least has some sense of what he or she is doing. And that is what happened. I was lucky enough, as I said, to be the beat writer on those three seasons covering Joe Gibbs' team. And it was textbook. And where there is disarray, there's usually losing. And where there is no disarray and where egos are in check, a little bit anyway, mm -hmm you usually find uh, winning. And I think that's kind of the essence, to your point, that you've been saying about what we're talking about. Look at the class leadership of these organizations, these, all these that we've mentioned. Uh, and when, when teams are losing or having trouble or the t current Washington team looks back on this and wonders <laughs> why, well, we can look at the leadership. But don't so they it's kind of ironic say... that our number one team is the 85 Bears yeah. who, who, who couldn't get along. I right, mean, that's that, what I was just know, about to say. The leadership was solid. The yeah, Harris family, yeah. McCaskey, right? Solid right. as well. Right, oh yeah, but just it within <laughs> with the head coach and the mm -hmm. defensive coordinator. Didn't sustain and the, it. They yeah. Isn't there something that people say, though, that winning cures all ills mm -hmm. or that they cover them up? And so things that are going wrong, you don't always see uh, how maybe cancerous something is underneath. And the Patriots and that Wickersham article sort of highlighted some of the little like things going on in this Patriots organization, which sort of mm -hmm. makes it stunning that they've been able to keep things and, and get to the highest point of the mountaintop, regardless of what sort of strife is going on internally. Well, again, um, with all due respect to the, the, the writer with the Patriots, I mean, they went out and won another Super Bowl, right? Right. And, again, when you've got Belichick and Brady as kind of the centerpiece foundation points for everything you're building around, then you've got a, a great advantage there. But um, I, I think the thing that comes to mind when I think about the Bears and that one season and the chemistry and so on and so forth, just think they couldn't sustain it. Okay, for whatever reasons, and you know there are multiple layers, but yeah, the Buddy Ryan, you know, Mike Dicker class being a real big one, and um, the, the the lack of chemistry with the team, and and then Buddy leaves, and what that meant to everything. So when you can't sustain it, then that really kind of, you know, ends your greatness or diminishes your your greatness. So yeah, you can say you had it for one year, and winning cured everything for one year. Mm -hmm. 
if you're the Cowboys, you had it going on for you know four or five years, but you couldn't sustain it, and and so you know that's the byproduct of you know not having chemistry really that is going to be lasting, if you will.